My name is Brad and I will be moderating today's discussion, Mental Health Matters, Cultivating Resilience, Wellbeing and Community. Mm. I'm the founder of a charity called Alike and our mission is to combat loneliness and isolation amongst people diagnosed with cancer. We aim to achieve this mission by using modern communication methods. We have developed a new app um, to help forge the new digital cancer community. Mm. I'm really passionate about this because I myself am a leukemia survivor. I was diagnosed with cancer when I was 19 mm. and then again at 24 and developed the idea for like when I was in my hospital bed receiving a bone marrow transplant. So this topic is very, very important to me and I'm so honoured to be here alongside um, Lem Sissi, um, Sissé, Sissé, yeah. Sissé, apologies. Uh, no, no, it's okay, it can be said many different ways, no, yeah. really. <laughs> I was once called, was uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Lemon Sissy. Sissy. <laughs> <laughs> Has anybody watched RuPaul's Drag Race, Sissy, that work? <laughs> <laughs> um, an honoured poet and activist, um, Elvis Martin, uh, Martin, yeah. <laughs> a young leader and a member of the Anti-Racism Task Force for the Victorian Government. Um, and we were meant to be joined by Florence Gibbon, but unfortunately she couldn't be here today. Um, but I'm so grateful and honor honoured to be moderating this discussion. So, we have 20 minutes, so uh, let's dive right into it, shall we? Len, the first one is for you. Yes. Yeah? Getting, getting, getting comfy? Yeah, yeah, I just realised yeah, yeah. I was moving my chair Set unnecessarily. <laughs> Set yourself in? Yeah. Right, yeah. Don't worry, I won't grill you. <laughs> what yes. role do safe spaces for sharing personal stories and experiences play, especially what? when it comes to normalising mental health challenges and improving mental wellbeing. Okay, what role do safe spaces play in, in, um, in helping people with yeah. their wellbeing? Yeah. Uh, I have no idea. Uh, no, <laughs> that's not true. Um, uh, it's not difficult to find yourself in a situation where you feel like you're the only one. Mm. The only one who's experienced something. And that sense of isolation, that, that can promote inside of you. That nobody's experienced this as you've experienced this. That when you cry, you cry alone because of that one singular experience. And that can be the most debilitating uh, experience um, and the way to break that is to find others mm -hmm. you see mm -hmm. it's all about others and ultimately you come to realize that i mean honestly Ultimately, I came to realize that everybody has a, had a unique experience, but not everybody has been in a position where they realize, that, where they feel so isolated by it, awesome. and therefore need to search for an answer. Mm. Point is this, I don't totally know what safe space means, but I know a safe space when I can feel it. Yes. I don't know what a safe space means, but I know it's not a safe space when somebody makes me feel unsafe. And I think I need to get away from here. Mm -hmm. I need to find myself and I need to find people who've experienced what I've experienced so that we can, for a moment, cling to each other. So that we, for, for a moment we can recognize and see each other. Mm -hmm. but but the point is about the safe space. It is not there for us to cling to each other and never leave. You see, mm -hmm. the, the, the height of well-being, the power of the safe space, mm -hmm. is that you can go into it and out of it with your head raised high, knowing that you've always got somebody who has got your that's what this is about. It's about empowerment. Mm -hmm. um, I was brought up in care in, in children's homes and for 18 years of my life. I was stolen from my mother who, was, um, who, was, uh, who came to England and found herself pregnant and was put into a mother and baby home, which was the English way of dealing with women who were pregnant, who didn't have a, a husband, because they were seen as like estrogen terrorists. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So they had to be housed and have their children taken away from them. 
My mother refused to have me taken from her, so the social worker gave me to foster parents and said to them, treat this as, a, as, a, as an adoption, he's yours forever. Mm. They then got rid of me at 12, I was in a series of children's homes, then I left the children's homes at 18, um, thinking that my name was Norman. Freaking Norman. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the social worker, he took me from my mum, he gave them to the social worker, foster parents, he said, treat this as an adoption, he's yours forever, his name is Norman, that's the only thing. And um, because I was the, the only black child in an area, and he was like, he was like, he was like, take him into the community, call him Norman, and nobody will know. <laughs> <laughs> So they got rid of me at 12, then I was ahead in a series of children's homes, blah, blah, blah. We've all got a war story. Mm. The point is, is that I left there with no family, and I spent my life searching for my family, and I found them all over the world. But the point is this. The thing that makes me different, the reason that I needed that safe space to talk to people in, actually is the bridge to people. Mm -hmm. It's not the ravine. There is not a ravine between me and somebody who's not had my experience. Mm -hmm. I empower myself in safe spaces so that I can bridge, build bridges. Mm -hmm. I'd better stop talking because no, I can just try. go on and on. I know how to do that. You know, we are amongst bridge builders here. This is what's happening with Absolutely. the One Young World Summit. My story is an old story. I've written, made documentaries and films and etc. And also, I do a thing called the Christmas dinners, yeah. which is for care leavers on Christmas Day. Mm. Because when I was in care, uh, Christmas was the, uh, the, the most lonesome time of the year, because mm -hmm. it was a reminder of everything that I'd never had. Yeah. Mm. And so I set up this thing called the Christmas dinners, where the community comes together, they put on Christmas dinners for care leavers uh, on, on Christmas Day. On Christmas, oh, we can't do that. Our institution can't do Christmas Day, you see, because all of the workers are working. So we'll have it a few days before Christmas or a few days after Christmas. Do the impossible if you find in solutions, right? So mm -hmm. I wanted a Christmas dinner on Christmas Day for people between 18 and 25 who'd spend time in care. It started in 2013 in Manchester, uh, and then there was one in Hackney, and last, last year, in the pandemic, there was 24 Christmas dinners in cities all over the country. And so we delivered the dinners to people, basically, as well. Also, they get presents, top presents, not second-hand things, not blah, blah things, top gifts. And the food on Christmas Day is made by a top chef. Okay, it has to be a top chef. It has to be top presents, right? There's no reason why, when working with other people, uh, people who are in need, that we should give them less. Absolutely. So, can I jump in on that? Please do, because you need to shut me up. Yeah, Elvis, I would love to ask you a question. Sorry. Because I completely agree with you from a peer support perspective, so, and I love what you were saying, because I was going to ask you, this is a safe space, by the way, um, everybody. Um, seldom do you have safe space um, over the door. Like yes. It's created by people. Safe yes. Spaces. yes. It's, as you said, it's that feeling. And I remember um, engaging in peer support services for people diagnosed with cancer, and it was, this is a massive generalisation, but I'm going to say it anyway. It always felt that like peer support um, for people really in need was like relegated back, like to a broken down community centre with a leak in, uh, a leak in the roof. And I was like, I'm sick of that. Why can't people have premium user experiences? Like I want to develop an app where the brand it looks um, like you want you relate to the brand, like you see yourself in it, you want to engage in it. Like we have the Instagrams, the, the Facebooks, the Snapchats, the all of these wonderful big brands that people like to engage with. Why can't that be a charity? So it's premium user experience. So thank you for saying that. Thank, thank you for you. all the work that you do. It's yeah. extraordinary. Elvis, I'm coming to you. Um, according to the World Health Organization, around 20% of the world's children and adolescents have a mental health condition. Um, what would you say are the main challenges that young people face around their mental health and well-being in our societies? Thank you so much for the question and first thank you so much for sharing your story and I was able to relate to it because I am a suicide survivor myself and I every Christmas is difficult for me still after separation from my family when I came out to my family and things fall apart. So for me it is something. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. So th th that's right, 20% of uh, young people around the world uh, experience mental health challenges and uh, 
the thing is that that's and, and social media definitely play a big role with mental health uh, a lot of young people these days are sucked into this social media life mm -hmm. and Instagram life and when their own life falls short of it mm -hmm. that's where they started to fall uh, through the gap of the system and then mental health and then the problem is that young people doesn't have proper access in many countries this is an issue for many countries that don't have access to mental health one government doesn't really focus on mental health because there is a lot of stigma and there is no community campaigns because every time any big change that need to happen community community need to be behind it and if there is a lot of stigma about mental health so that means that there's not a big initiative or campaigns that are run by community that are forcing politicians to take some action and 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 create that space to fund mental health services or support so that young people can go and access that mm -hmm. and in some countries we do have mental health uh, support and services but then uh, there is gaps in the system where people fall through the gaps for example in my case sorry for for example in my case I was an international student to Australia mm -hmm. and uh, grown up in a very uh, sub not supported uh, good family like like I had everything I was never aware of what mental health is what homelessness is what domestic violence is family violence is and suddenly one night changed everything mm. I came out from a luxurious apartment in Melbourne to sleeping on the street mm. so it was difficult mm. and but then when you want to access the support for mental health, though that was not the time where I was looking for support and I was not even aware of it. So this is mm -hmm. another part mm -hmm. that is, there's not enough promotion of the support and services that are, that are available for young people. Uh, so I want to access support and services. Finally, when I want to access support and services, that was not made available to me mm -hmm. because of my visa status. Okay. So, a lot of refugees, asylum seekers do go through these challenges. A lot of international students go through challenges. Not just a lot of international, even the locals in every country have this, uh, the, there's a gap, there's a ba gap between community where like a lot of private schools talk about mental health these days and, and how support services are available, but public schools always are behind in, on mm. these topics. Mm -hmm. So that's why the marginalized community uh, usually miss out on uh, what's happening and um, so yeah, so the, the accessing services. Accessing services yeah. is the main thing, and, and it is uh, important. And then when going back to the social media, social media is causing like a lot of people. Like for example, I'm a frequent user of Instagram, and I have seen how people seek for that perfect life and fancy things that you see on social media. And uh, social media need to be more. I think social media giants need to be more accountable in terms of how, what sort of a content they are promoting. And I think social media companies need to uh, invest their CSR, CSR is a corporate social responsibility in mental health campaigns and campaigns that actually support community uh, issues. As well, I feel like we need to be accountable to ourselves when it comes to how we use social media and what, what we're presenting to the world that it might be the highlights real and all of the good things, but it's also the challenges that come with that as well. Because mm -hmm. sometimes I think, I'm, I talk about social media and mental health. Uh, um, social media and mental health is what am I putting out there that's making other people potentially feel bad yeah. or um, are not as worthy. So I think we all have a role to play in that. And in the UK as well, uh, you were mentioning accessing services. There's um, a f the postcode lottery of accessing mental, mental health services here in the UK is, is quite drastic. Uh, you can be treated um, in a rural hospital in a countryside and not get um, equitable mental health care, but then be treated in a, a really big university hospital in central London and get good mental health care um, and everything in between. So yeah, absolutely, the accessing of services and postcode lottery. Definitely, if I can add one point to that, like uh, in my home, like in Australia, uh, for anyone who's not a permanent resident or a citizen, if they feel societal, so this happened to many times when I was supporting international students or refugees and asylum seekers. So when, when someone feels societal, you take them to the hospital emergency because that's where they can get that crisis support. You need to have $675 to do that. Mm -hmm. You need to have $675 in your pocket to feel societal. 
So that is that is that's that's just a broken system, yeah, and right. and uh, and that can again can be only changed if there is community campaigns and if there is community behind really talking to politicians, whichever party you support, and really advocating for change. Free healthcare. That's right. Universal, Universal healthcare. healthcare. That's what yeah. we need, right? <laughs> Um, I just want to say before we move on to the next question for you, uh, Lem, I just thank you both so much for sharing as well and sharing your lived experiences. Like it really, it really means a lot uh, to sit here and listen to them. Thanks. So thank Thanks you. For that. So, um, Lem, this one's for you. Yeah. You've yeah. worked with the yeah. South Bank Centre, Royal Academy, yeah. the Olympics, British Film Institute, to name a few. Yeah. Um, how do the arts create better mental health and forge community? Uh, it's a good question, but lots have come to my mind. To mind, the arts is a great way, a great conduit for understanding how a person really feels. Because sometimes how you feel can't be articulated in an environment which feels unnatural. And I think arts is one of the ways that we we tap into the nature of a person. Mm -hmm. So. I did a, a series on television called, uh, not a series, a show called Super Kids, where I did a workshop getting young people to write poetry, and their social workers learned more about them through the poems that they'd written than through any case conference, than through any uh, institutionally curated feedback system, which actually just replicated the system that was being fed back to. In other words, how do we read the language of somebody who's in need outside of the structures that we've built to help them? Do, do, does that make sense? What I'm trying to say is that, that what I'm, I'm, I'm not asking you whether it makes sense, actually. I'm saying that the arts is a way of seeing, it's like a, the arts is like a glass-bottomed boat through the ocean of a person. Right. And you see the depth. Yes, of course. And yet you see the surface as well. Yeah. Um, and it's a wonderful way of engaging. And creativity is not the monopoly of artists. Mm -hmm. This is really important. Creativity is in every single individual here. Mm -hmm. And it enacts itself in ways. Maybe creativity enacts itself in ways that identify that people who speak on stage and who are even in this audience have decent shoes mm. and, 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 and what about those who don't and who can't? I mean, I'm, my Nikes are as white as white can be, you know, the, 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 and I need mental health support, mm. but there are those who are not here, who are not in the room. As, as well, you know, it's easy to play to the outside, but it's true, mm. you know. So I, I see... It's a form of expression. I'll tell you, I'll give you an example. When I do, uh, when I did the workshop, I've said on Super Kids, yes, yes. right, getting young people in care to write poetry and people, get them to write poetry and they'll feel better about themselves. No, not necessarily. Not necessarily. We're, we're, we're going to act in this. On the first day of that documentary, with the television cameras in the, in the workshop, something which I didn't want to happen mm. because that was the precious space, and then I realised, oh, documentary is about documenting. It's about seeing all of the action. Mm -hmm. It's about the truth of the moment, mm -hmm. not just the presentation, mm -hmm. not just the nice shoes of it, the nice trainers of it. I say this for a reason. Yes. And on the first day, a young woman, as I'm about to give my workshop to prove all of this stuff that I'm telling you is true, she stood up and said, I'm not having this, and walked out, and the camera followed her, and that was the end I was like, this, how can I prove that arts works for uh, this glass bottom boat theory? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. When this person stood up and just said, I'm not having it, and walked out. The fact is, her not having it and walked out is what it's about. Is what it's about. And if you provide a service for well-being and somebody doesn't, doesn't relate to it in the way that you want them to, that's a test of you. Yeah. It's a test of your service. Mm -hmm. It's the ultimate that that person who's not in this room m is, is shown to matter. Mm. So I followed her out of the room and then I punished her and said, right, you can never come in here again. And that was that. <laughs> Sorry, that was a joke. It wasn't funny. It really wasn't funny. It was the wrong time to do it. You really got a giggle. No, yeah. yeah, I got a giggle. But the point is, is that she actually became the true story of the entire documentary. Mm. Uh, and what she did was incredible mm. 
Um, so, so, it, so it sounds like people wanted a space for true expression, though, right? And do you think that's what social media takes away from us, right? Is well, it space for true, authentic expression? You know, we're always... Look, I'm not, I don't have the nice trainers on every time of the day, you know. Uh, so, but, but I like to have them on. So liking having them on is as true an expression as, yeah. you know, as having dirty ones. The... I've sort of lost myself there, actually. Sorry, don't but throw you. What, what I learned from what you said before about, about um, social media is this is if every one of us here now says that I'm going to say something truthful to show a certain vulnerability once a week, mm. mm -hmm. right, every Friday or something, you're going to say, you're just going to show a vulnerability that you have, you know, like a, you're frightened of spiders. I'm, I'm frightened of spiders, and if I see them, it makes me crumble and not want to get out the house. At times that I didn't want to move, go out of the house because I was just too panicky. Um, I love myself, but sometimes I hate myself and I don't know how to get out of it. Whatever. Once a week, if we did that, all of us, it could help to change the game. Maybe that's a challenge for everybody. Yeah, we do, do that. that. Yeah. Show some uh, vulnerability or ask a question uh, of, your, of your Twitter followers, whether they're 10 or 10,000. Ask a question of them that matters, like... Um, what mattered to you today? And just watch the re responses that come back. Thank everybody you. wants to show themselves to be nice because <coughs> everybody wants to show themselves. And, and it's just a self-fulfilling thing. Yes. If we want to change what's in social media, then we can do that. It's, it's for us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. And, and I believe. And thank you for <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, Elvis, I'm coming to you. Um, Mental health and well-being is not just important for us all in our daily lives, it's also a basic human right. Um, what policy measures can be taken to ensure that mental health needs are addressed um, adequately and sufficiently? So governments around the world, uh, according to the World Health Organization, only spend 2% of their uh, annual expenditure on mental health, uh, whereas uh, Definitely, like every government can do more, and majority, as, as we, the first question says, like 20% of uh, young people uh, around the world experience mental health, mm. so 2% of uh, annual expenditure is not going to fix mm. the system. Uh, what governments need to do and what policies they need to have is, first, you will hear around election time, especially in countries where mental health is spoken, so governments always put out policies at saying that they're going to fix this, they're going to do this, they're going to do that. They can't do anything until they have structures. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is uh, like investing in the uh, mental health infrastructure. And uh, what I mean by that is um, having, for example, Victoria, where I'm coming from, state in Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, Victoria have recently done a Royal Commission into Mental Health. And that was the best thing. Because Royal Commission was an inquiry uh, independent inquiry from government and that hand down the dis uh, recommendations to government what need to change and government pick up that recommendation and make things happen and community members actually like make submissions and and uh, attend the inquiry so that they tell the royal commission what's happening and what is needed uh, with uh, so in, in in terms of infrastructure mental health uh, health and uh, mm. sorry health <laughs> health infrastructure, uh, so we have now mental health branch, so that is specific for mental health, and we have a lived experience branch, so where uh, people with lived experience, that branch is run by lived experience. Mm. The premier of the state have uh, funded uh, over $8 billion, and, uh, and when the Royal Commission gave the recommendation, he said, I'm giving an empty check, like a blank check, so wow. as much as it's required. Wow. So that is a big change. And I think government around the world uh, should do um, <laughs> What advice would you give your younger self or to somebody going through a mental health um, issue right now? Big, big question for 30 seconds, That's but what springs to mind? Uh, definitely uh, be yourself and, uh, and there's no shame in experiencing mental health and mental health is a phase. It's not something that will be there forever. Uh, so it's just a phase and if you get a proper help and support, you'll be all right. Thank you. Thank you. Can I? I am not defined by my scars, but by the incredible ability to heal. Beautiful. Thank you.